welcome everybody to Mount Pleasant Baptist Church in Gloucester, Mississippi. We're actually, what, eight miles out of there? But uh, that's our physical address is Gloucester, Mississippi. And tonight as we go into it, those, those songs were absolutely perfect, uh, Brother Raymond, for, for what we're studying in the book of Hebrews. It really speaks to it. Uh, if, if you're scared to come to church on Sunday because, you know, there's a different crowd or, you know, a little bit too crowded for you, we have plenty of room on Wednesday night. And uh, I tell you what, God's Word uh, is true on Sunday, and it's true on Monday, and Wednesday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. It is true. And if you want to come join with some believers, you're more than welcome here. We definitely have enough space that we can socially distance here, and you can be comfortable in being in the church services. So tonight, if you look at Hebrews chapter 3, Hebrews chapter 3, we're going to look at verses, um, let's read verses 7 through 11 to begin with, and we'll just keep going from there. Uh, Brother Allen, we'll just keep going from there. Hebrews chapter 3, we'll look at verses 7 through 11. Let's read these scriptures right here. It says, Therefore, just as the Holy One, a Holy Spirit says, Today you hear my voice, hear his voice. Do not harden your hearts as when they provoked me, as in the day of trial in the wilderness. Where your fathers tried me by testing me and saw my works for 40 years. Therefore, I was angry with this generation. I said, they always go astray, watch this, in their heart. And they did not know my ways. As I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. Thank you, Lord, for your holy word. As we're looking at this, you know, in, in a lot of places in the Bible, what it does is it warns us not to harden our heart. It's the common occurrence of what happens in society, and we don't even think of it as a hardening of our heart. So that it means setting ourselves against God, being stubborn. Now, of course, right here in this congregation, there's nobody stubborn in this congregation. Thank you, Lord. But sometimes when we're out there and we see God's holy word, we respond in stubbornness to how he tells us to live our lives or how we should praise and worship him or how we should keep things holy. So a lot of times we, we get stubborn and, and we're not even willing to repent and go to him for forgiveness because we don't think we need to. So when you look back in the scriptures, what it's speaking of right here, the Israelites had became hard-hearted. What, and, and when they disobeyed God's command to conquer the promised land. He told them, uh, um, this is what's called provoking God, by the way. Because he told them, go on over. Cross on over into the promised land. It's going to be flowing with milk and honey. This is where there's going to be places for you to live that you never built. All the promises that God made to them, but they did not do it. See, a lot of times, we ought to be careful that we're obeying God's word, and, and not allow our hearts to be hardened, not allow ourselves to think we know better than God. God says, as a, as a believer, as a born-again believer, do we believe God's word? It's somewhere we ought to search our hearts, right? I mean, Paul talks about it over and over. He says, search yourself. I, I, is there something not right in my life? Is there something I'm not handling correctly because if you look deeply there's times where we drift away and we rationalize every part of what we do and why we do it you ever say something you shouldn't have said you ever do something you didn't you shouldn't have done but you rationalize because you said well they deserved it or or something we, we we come up and come up with a reason of why we did it but it goes against God's word now you wonder why we don't experience all the blessings of God why we're not having the blessings that God promises in the word is sometimes it's because our heart is hardened. So what is a hardened heart to begin with? Well, for one thing, so we know that blood is life, and if the heart does not squeeze properly, you're not living the way you should. I have what's called a hardened heart. It, it, and the, it's, a, it's a physical thing. And in this... My blood does not get squeezed the way it should. Thus, I have health issues. 
So look at this spiritually. If your heart is hardened, you're not experiencing the flow of the blessings of God that you should have. Now, when it talks about in that verse 11 right there, it talks about God's rest. What exactly is God's rest? Because people look for it. So it has several meanings in Scripture. One of the meanings is it talks about the, the seventh day of creation and that weekly Sabbath uh, that's, that's commemorating that. All right? And then we have where it talks about God's rest, and it's talking about that when it's in the promised land, crossing over the promised land of Canaan. And it talks about God's rest with the peace of God uh, because of our relationship with Jesus Christ through faith. And then it's, uh, it talks about that God's rest is, uh, on our future eternal life with, with Christ. All of these meanings were probably familiar to the Jewish Christians that were reading this particular letter in uh, Hebrews right here. So when you look on, it says in verses 12 through 14, 12 through 14 right there, it says, now take care, brethren, that there not be any one of you, one of you, an evil, unbelieving heart that falls away from the living God. But encourage one another after day, as long as it is still called today. I want you to watch it. it. That was so important right there. Go back just a little bit. I know I'm throwing off the sequence here. But encourage one another day after day. You know one of the hardest things with this, this COVID thing is the way the devil has set up this battle is people don't come to church because they're afraid of the disease. So they don't get encouragement from their brothers and sisters in Christ. If we're not careful, what happens is... In, Next thing you know, we, we quit reading God's word. But encourage one another day after day, as long as it's still called today, so that none of you will be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. Let's look at verse 14. For we have become partakers of Christ if we hold fast the beginning of our assurance firm until the end. So in, in today's society... Richard, would you look up a scripture while I'm uh, discussing this? Look up Ezekiel chapter 36. I want you to look up verses 20 through 22, and we're going to read through 27. Uh, Ezekiel 36, look verses 22 through 27. So when I had a call, and, uh, you know, everybody's, everybody's uh, upset. They're, they're very nervous. They're, they, they're watching the news 24-7, and... Everything's getting them fired up. So they called me about, you know, from everything from the, the Mississippi flag uh, to them tearing down statues of Jesus, taking pictures and burning them. All right, so I will partake of the part uh, where we're looking at statues of Jesus. So I, I want to tell everybody, I don't, I'm not trying to offend nobody. So what, what do you think Jesus looks like? Now, so we all have an image in our mind and in our heart. But do we have an actual picture, drawing, or anything of Jesus Christ? No. But we have something else that's said in Scripture that we should not have a graven image. Do you all know what a graven image is? So we don't know. So Michelangelo, he was an artist. You all know he did a lot of posing for pictures like Jesus. So a lot of people have Michelangelo hanging up in their house. <clears throat> the people on these Facebook things, they think it's hilarious because they'll take pictures of people from a movie called Star Wars. Now, I know most of y'all ain't ever heard of no Star Wars. But they wore these robes. And they had this one guy, he, I don't even know what part it was, but he was blue-eyed and he wore a robe. And they says, would you turn away from Jesus or share him? And they're sharing him, and he's a picture of a guy from Star Wars. You can tear down statues. You can burn pictures. That's not Jesus. He's on the right-hand side of the Father. Don't be afraid, because every knee shall bow, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Listen, if they burn this church down, we might get personally mad, but that does not mean the church has stopped. 
God is alive and well. See, our, our hearts are turning away from God when we refuse to believe his word 100%. 100. If we keep persisting in our unbelief that God's, God's going to leave us alone in that sin. In other words, you become this reprobate. It's a scary thought. When you persist in pursuing sin and you get so callous that you don't even hear the Holy Spirit calling to you no more. But God, it says in the Word, that He can take that old hard heart and He can change it, make it new. He says He can change your desires from, you know, where someone used to be an alcoholic, He can change His desires where all He wants is God Almighty. Someone who used to be a drug addict, all he wants to do is spread the good news of Jesus Christ. When, when somebody, he, he gives you a new spirit where you're not that same individual anymore and you don't live in, listen to this, this is important, hear me. You don't live in fear. He says he's not the author of fear or confusion. So what do you see going in society now? People run around burning stuff, makes you mad or all this kind of stuff. Here's the thing. Is God the author of that? No. So if God's not the author of it, who is? But we already know Satan has been defeated. So why do we live in fear? Why do we stay so focused on what somebody tells you? Here's what God told you. Don't be afraid. For I am with you always. So, read that scripture, Richard. Uh, verse 22. Chapter 36, verse 22 through 27. Read it loud. Turn around and face them so they can hear you. Broadcast. prevent an unbelieving heart. See, because a lot of times we don't even recognize it's unfortunate that you have an unbelieving heart. One thing is so important is to stay in fellowship with believers. It's, that's why it's in the Word. Listen, coming to church is not about just coming to some structure. It's part of being the body of Christ where we gather together to praise the Lord Jesus Christ. All we, two or more gather. It's two or more gather. It don't matter to me. Listen, I have preached with, I'm telling you, just a handful of people. I have drove for hours to preach in little places and pl that make this place look like the big city. But it's so important, and I believe that's one of the, the tactics of Satan today, is to separate people, to place them in fear. But now here's one thing. Now we should be aware of how somebody else feels. I wish I could get people to quit hand bumping, foot bumping, head bumping, and all this other stuff. Not because of you. I know you ain't scared. But it says, if that makes my brother uncomfortable, he says, well, if he don't like me eating meat, what's it say I should do? If it offends my brother that I eat meat, what should I do? Because they know about his cousins now. Who knows that? Don't eat meat. Is that not simple? Is there, now you go back to the original language and read that. So I got some wear masks, some don't wear masks. It's so important to be respectful so that we encourage other believers. 
to, to, to get them in there and, and not look down upon somebody else, but to encourage them. One of the things we need to do so is, is stay in fellowship. The others talk daily about your, your, your mutual faith with this brother or sister in Christ. Now, I know everybody in this whole country is talking about all the burning and the diseases. When's the last time you told somebody about Jesus Christ and how he saved you and how you don't have to be afraid and how you can have peace that passes understanding and how you can stand on a solid rock don't matter what anything happens because Jesus told me a promise. That's all that matters is the promises of Jesus Christ. And if the born-again believers would start talking their faith, it says be angry and sin not. Now understand what that word anger is. It's angry about sin in itself. And we got to be aware of how deceitful sin is. So what does sin do? Sin tells you that 99% truth to get that 1% lie. All it wants to do is distract you. What sin does is it attracts kind of like a Venus flytrap. You ever see one of them things on these Venus fly traps? They grow down there in them swamps in Louisiana. So it's this critter that looks like a fly. And it's got these long thorns, I guess you'd say. They go all up and down the mouth of this critter, and it's literally a mouth. And inside it has a sweet smelling nectar. And lo and behold, here comes a little bug. He flies around the end of that mouth. He says, Well, that must not be too bad. That don't look like teeth. It looks like it smells good. I think it tastes good. I think I'm going to crawl into it. And when that critter crawls into that Venus flytrap, that thing closes up on it. And then it consumes it over time. It ain't even killed instantly. You know what it does? It's digested while it's alive. Sin does that to people. What did, he, what did Satan tell Eve? Surely you shall not die. Well, did she die instantly when she ate the fruit? No. But she died. Spiritually. Later on, she died in the flesh. But Jesus, but Jesus saved us all. See, we got to be, as born-again believers, encouragers of each other. It's so easy to tear everybody down. Because they can tear you down for wearing masks and tear you down for not wearing masks. They can tear you down for where you sit, tear you down for not sitting in the pew. Tear you down for coming, tear you down for not coming. Tear you down for all sorts of stuff. Here's the word, though. What does the word tell us to do? Build people up in the word. It says in uh, chapter 3, verse 15 through 19. Let's look at this there. It says, now while it is said, today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. And when they provoked me, for who provoked him when they had heard? Indeed, did not all those who came out of Egypt led by Moses? And with whom was he angry for 40 years? Was it not with those who sinned, whose bodies fell in the wilderness? And to whom did he swear that they would not enter his rest, but to those who were disobedient? So we see that they were not able to enter because of that key word again is unbelief. The, the Israelites had received a promise, but they failed to enter the promised land because they didn't believe in God's protection. They said, them giants is too big for us. Well, let me ask you. So what's going on in society today? We are talking about everything except Jesus Christ. Everything except God. Gripe about everything everybody else is doing because we're doing it right. But the problem you see with these people is they didn't believe that God was going to help them conquer the giants in the land. So it can be any particular subject. It can be all those people going around burning stuff if that's your thing. God's in control. 
don't be afraid. God can do whatever he wants. But are we praying or are we griping? You know, each one of us go through things in our lives and, and you know, we, we go through situations. Do we take it that God can get us through? Or do we look at it and say, oh, I have got to fix it. Some men are the world's worst about fixing things. So our wives come to us and all they want to do is talk. And I know none of these guys right here would do this. But sometimes all they want somebody to do is listen to them. But what does a man got to do? He's got to fix it. Got to fix it. We got to change it. Let me tell you. What we need to do is listen to the Father. You see, he's made the promise that he's the fixer. He says, I can take your heart, I can change it. We look at somebody and we say, man, they ain't never going to change. They have always been a heathen. Well, what we're saying is, God, you're alive. Nope, they've always been a drunkard. Yep, can't ever get well. No, nope. you're saying God's alive. You don't, you don't understand. What we're doing is, now, Brother Blaine, I've been around these people all my life. I know this. Let me tell you, I know that God can do anything because he told me in the word. And we have to trust in him. Not, it says, we don't go by sight. So what are we always doing when we're saying those things? We're going by sight. Churches die because they go by sight. God made a promise. There is nothing, nothing that God can't do. So what happened when, when they didn't believe that God was going to keep his promises? God sent them over there in the wilderness to walk around for 40 years. So that particular group died off. That's a whole lot different than what God had originally planned for them. And it's the same way with us. God has a plan. He says, I have a plan to bless you and not curse you. But so many times we say, God, you must be cursing me. We don't say it verbally. But we question everything going on. He says, I can change a curse into a blessing. He says it in the word. So how many times in our lives, you know, the biggest mistakes we make is when we trust our own flesh to fix the problems. We trust our own self to take care of the problem. When God said, God said, if we're doing what we need to do, if we're doing what we need to do, so are we inviting people to church? Man, it's hard right now inviting people to church. Woo-wee! But are we doing it? Are we sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ with them? Or are we talking about just the news? See, what happens, that lack of trust in God it, it, it always prevents us from getting God's best for our lives. Do you know somebody who's going through something and they just, they, they, I don't, they're just, they're to ropes in. They need someone to speak scripture with them and encourage them and not tear them down. They need someone to come over there and pray in the name of Jesus Christ. Maybe, maybe someone even listening on this computer. Have you been getting God's best. Why not? What is it that we're not, is God telling us the truth or is the Bible just something we need to keep around for a keepsake? Is it truly the holy word or is it just a good word? It says in chapter 4, verses 1 through 3. Let's read verses 1 through 3. It says, Therefore, let us fear if, while a promise remains of entering his rest, any one of you may seem to have come short of it. For indeed, we have had good news preached to us, just as they also, but the word they heard did not profit them, because it was not united by faith in those who heard. Hmm. For we have believed, for, for we who have believed entered the rest, just as he has said, as I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. I want you to get that now. My rest again. Although his works were finished from the foundation of the world. So some of, some of the Jewish Christians 
who got this letter, they, they may have been on the very verge of turning back from the promised rest in Jesus Christ. Just like in Moses' day, uh, they turned back. They didn't believe. They didn't trust. They turned back from the promised land. So in both these cases, they thought that, that present trouble of that moment. Don't you think about this. Listen. The moments of that trouble, that, that present problem that they had, was so much bigger than the promises of God. How many times has that been us? How many times have we seen the problems and thought they were bigger than God? So let me ask. We all know in Scripture it talks about plagues and it talks about all sorts of famines. It talks about all sorts of disasters. Were any of that bigger than God? See, that's where we're at. Is the things that you're seeing bigger than your God? Could be bigger than your officials in your state. Could be bigger than the president of our nation. But are they bigger than God? See, what happens if we're not careful, we start trusting our efforts instead of Christ's power in all the dangerous situations that we're in. The Israelites doubted that God was going to keep his word. How many times have we doubted God? And we don't word it that way. Just remember, we never word it that way. But this is where we either grow with Christ or we retreat. And I'm afraid one of the biggest problems we have in our lives is we never look at it in such a studied way of walking closer with Jesus. I was thinking, uh, you know, just, just a closer walk with thee. Just a closer walk with thee, Lord. And a lot of times we see these difficulties instead of the Savior. A lot of times we see the statue that ain't nothing but a statue. That is not your Savior. Jesus, who's over all. So the, the Israelites of, of in, in the time of Moses' days are a lot of like us that are in church today. They, they know a lot about Christ, but they didn't have that personal relationship with him. See, they knew a lot of God's word. They didn't keep it tied to the front of their head, some of it. But just because... I was, I was talking to somebody the other day. Just because somebody can quote you a lot and they've been in, in church all their lives does not mean that they're walking in the full blessings of God. If we're walking in fear, mm, you're not being all the blessings that you should have because he told us. He'd take care of that. If you're a worrier, and, and people have a tendency to worry about things. Here's the thing. But what's it called worry? He says, I'll give you rest. I will give you rest. And that's what we need. And we need to know him, per not just read about a character, not just read about Jesus, but to walk in the full faith of knowing who the Savior is. So a lot of times they don't combine their knowledge and their faith. So I've seen people that would win uh, Bible tournaments but they had zero faith in what they were proclaiming. They were always scared. There was a problem there. See, what we ought to do is when we talk about it, and we had a revival, and somebody was up here today, and, and we, we said, you're going to be preaching the good news of Jesus. And you're going to go out there and you're going to invite people to church and say, come hear the good news of Jesus. Well, the good news of Jesus is he'll give you rest. So if you've got something that everybody else won't, you've got the rest. See, we've got to believe in the Lord's Savior and then act upon what he's told us. Act upon the promises of the word of God. You know, that's what the biggest thing that would help us right now. We're spending so much time getting worried and upset and 
and fired up over issues that are not the issue. What's the issue today, y'all? Anybody believe Jesus Christ is coming back? Do you believe Jesus is coming back? I mean, today, I had two people just in just today that told me, Brother Blaine, I, I can't wait for Jesus to come back. Are you ready for Jesus to come back? I'm ready for Jesus to come back. Then what you scared of? If you're ready to go, and this is a sign of the time, come, Lord Jesus, come. I'm telling you, so the peace in the midst of the trials and the tribulations is the peace of knowing that no weapon formed, that Christ is in control. He knows me by name. He knows my future. He knows. But do I know him? So when we look at this scripture and, and, and look at verse, let's read one more verse. Verse 4. One more verse. I think. Yeah, we're just going to read verse 4. It's for he said, for he has said somewhere concerning the seventh day, and God rested on the seventh day from all his works. So, when you're reading that particular scripture, God didn't rest on the seventh day because he was tired. He wasn't worn out and said, man, I need a break. I have spent all this time creating all of everything out here. But what it was doing, it was, he was indicating the completion of the creation itself. So when he looked, he says, it was perfect. It, it was, and it's, it's satisfying to God. So the rest, the rest it talks about is that foretaste of the eternal joy when all the creation is renewed and restored, everything, every mark of sin is going to be removed, and the world will be made perfect again. Come, Lord Jesus, come. So our Sabbath rest in Christ begins when we, when we place our trust in him to complete his good and perfect work in us. We're always here. If I ain't heard this a hundred thousand times, I'm, uh, God's still working on me. Is God still working on you? So what's he working on? And am I allowing him to work? To have rest and the peace? You got to let him do the work. You know, I can go to the doctor with my heart. I can go up there with that doctor, and God can use anybody anywhere. He could touch me, whatever his will is. He's God. I trust him because he's made me a promise. But if he sends someone to help me, to minister to me, and I turn away from him, how wise would I be? Not very. The Holy Spirit comes to us. He speaks to us as we read this word. That's why it's so important you read the word, study it. You'll get peace that passes our understanding. Let us pray. Father, we thank you, God, for tonight on this Wednesday night. I thank you for every person who's here and everyone who's watching. Bless them, Lord. I pray for them, Father, no matter where they're at, no matter what's going on in their life, the Lord, they draw close to you that they rest in you. They find peace in you. No matter what happens with the world, it may burn. But our peace is in you. So, Lord, we seek you above all. We ask that you give our president wisdom, or those who are in positions of leadership wisdom. But our hope rests in you. So, Father, be with all these homes. Uh, may they get home safely. And may they rest peacefully in the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Thank you all so much for being here.